So I want to ask you to turn your Bibles to Jonah, the Old Testament book of Jonah, chapter 3. We're in week 3 of our series about this runner from God, a man who chose to run from God and from God's will. And what we learned about Jonah was that Jonah existed about 750 years before the birth of Christ, and he was called as a prophet of Israel to go and do something that was unique to the prophets of Israel. He was the only prophet uniquely called to go and preach to an enemy nation, an enemy nation, a pagan nation. And Jonah was reluctant to go, and not only was he reluctant, he ran from God. And uh, as we learn from the scripture, Jerusalem was located there, of course, in Israel. The city of Nineveh, which he was called to go to and preach, was 550 miles to the north and to the east of Jerusalem. Instead, Jonah headed west, and he tried to go as much as 2,500 miles west to a place called Tarshish. But as we learn from the story, Jonah boarded that ship. He got on the seas, and God brought a storm, and God brought a fish. And that fish eventually swallowed Jonah. He was burped up onto the dry land, as we talked about last week. And Jonah recorded in chapter 2 his prayer of confession, his prayer of understanding that God is merciful and that God is compassionate. And Jonah realized that he needed to go. So here we are in chapter 3, and we pick up with chapter 3, and we talk about the fact that Jonah is now going to Nineveh, finally doing what God wants him to do. And I've titled the sermon today, The Way of Grace. The way of grace. And what I want to illustrate for you through chapter 3 is the means by which we access God's grace in our lives. So I have two sets of keys up here. This is my set of keys. Okay? It's like four or five keys. This is Carly Luritz's set of keys. You can tell she's much more important than I am. But it's all organized, actually. She has color coding on all of these hooks and stuff and all these keys. How many of you ever locked yourself out of your house only to have to break into your own house to get into it, right? Yeah, I've done the same thing. Out of all these keys, there's only one key that will open the door to my house. No matter how much I want these other keys to open the door to my house, if I don't have it with me, I'm not going to be able to get inside. No matter how much I believe my house exists (laughs) and that it's there. Unless I have the right key to open that door and to go into it to access my house, I'm not going to be able to. I bring that up because this is what it means for us in accessing grace. That there is a means by which we access grace. There is a way by which we make ourselves available to grace. Yes, it's there. We may believe that it exists, but how do we experience it? Well, the story of Jonah in chapter 3 illustrates that. And as much as we've talked about, as much as we've talked about the God of grace and compassion, we have to understand what it takes to access that grace and that compassion. I'm not talking about earning it. We can never earn or deserve God's grace. But how do I make myself available to it? There are three components to the means of grace, the way of grace. Here's the first one. There, first of all, must exist a message of truth. There's a message of truth that comes our way to which we must respond. So let's look in verses 1 through 4. Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time. Remember, it came to him the first time in chapter 1. He refused to go. It came to him the second time, and he was more ready this time, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it the message that I tell you. So Jonah arose and went to Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was exceedingly great city, three days' journey in breadth. Jonah began to go into the city, going on a day's journey. He called out, yet 40 days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. So Jonah is now going into the city, and he's preaching this message, and he's essentially saying this, the the countdown clock has begun. You've got 40 days to repent. You've got 40 days to turn to Yahweh. Otherwise, if you don't, the city is going to be overthrown. It's going to be destroyed. What's going on here is similar to what happened with Sodom and Gomorrah with respect to God's punishment of evil and of sin. Now, it mentions here the three days journey. Let me quickly explain that for you because if you're doing the math in your head, you're thinking to yourself, man, that was a big city. Well, it really wasn't that big of a city. It had about 120,000 people in it in that day. The average human being can walk around 20 miles a day. So again, if you're doing the math from Pearland 
to the woodlands is about 50 miles. You say, well, there's no way that that city was that big, and you'd be right. What the Bible is referring to here, and with the word journey, which is found also in the book of Ezekiel and in Nehemiah, that word journey has to do with the way that hospitality was shown in the ancient Eastern world. Jonah went into the city, and according to the customs, he was practicing hospitality, which meant that he would pay due respect to those, and he would stop along the way. That's why it took so long. So it's not talking about the breadth of the city as much as it is the way that you get around the city in its breadth. Okay? So Jonah here goes about a day of doing this hospitality stuff, He reaches at some point in the city, and he begins to preach the word of God. Now, I believe that Jonah didn't preach it just once. I think he preached it probably several times. And in essence, what's going on here is he is proclaiming a message of truth. And that's what I really want to say as far as accessing the grace of God. There must be a message of truth that comes our way. There's two parts of this. Two parts of this. In the message of truth, it's illustrated here in what Jonah says. First of all, Jonah is talking about the holiness of God. Remember, he's talking about God is going to bring judgment to these people. God is going to punish sin. I mean, this was an evil, immoral city. The prophet Nahum calls it the city of bloodshed. Later on in the chapter, when the king proclaims that the whole city should repent, He tells the city to turn from their bloodshed. So there was a violent and ruthless and obviously an immoral city that was present here. What we've got to learn and remember from Jonah, again, as much as we've discussed God's compassion and mercy, is that God is not only a God of love. He is also a God of holiness. He is also a God who judges sin. Now, I want to ask you to embrace this and just kind of let that set for a moment. Because often we have in our minds this kind of false extreme choice that's going on. Either God is loving or God is holy. Either God, you know, is loving and doesn't punish sin or God is just and he does punish sin. What I want to say to you that both of those things are true. And they exist in the same. It's a false dichotomy to separate the love of God from the holiness of God, which is ultimately expressed in wrath. You cannot, here's the point, you cannot understand God's love apart from understanding God's holiness. Now hold on to that because we're going to come back to that at the very end. And as we see that all of this is illustrated in Christ Jesus ultimately, all right? So this God who is holy, who is just, is about to exact justice upon this city because of their evil. That's an essential thing in understanding the means of grace and understanding grace in itself. But here's the other thing that's going on in the message of truth. Jonah, his his message, what he's proclaiming is illustrating the whole nature of truth. This is important because in our day and age, we wrestle with things being true with a capital T. We tend to resist truth. Here's what I mean by that. Just like the truth I just shared with you that God is holy and he is just and he is going to punish sin, that's hard for us to embrace. But truth comes from the outside to us sometimes and it challenges our assumptions. Truth has a way of confronting those assumptions, confronting our self-made beliefs. This is what truth does. That's why it's truth, okay? For we all have a tendency to want to create truth rather than discover truth to invent it from within ourself rather than to find it. Blaise Pascal, the 17th century philosopher, who was a believer, French philosopher, said this, people almost invariably arrive at their beliefs not on the basis of proof, but on the basis of what they find attractive. Now, if that was true in the 17th century, it is really true in the 21st. we tend to want to either ignore truth that we're not comfortable with, dismiss it, right? Just kind of slough over it. Or we tend to want to compromise it, kind of water it down a little bit, right? To say, well, all truth is the same. You have your truth. I have my truth. Your truth works for you. My truth works for me. That's fine in the matter of preferences, okay? Of course, But what about large questions of life and mortality and eternity? 
I mean, I bet you wouldn't hold to that idea that my truth works for me, your truth works for you, if my truth said that I could come to your house and take all your belongings. <laughs> you, wouldn't, you wouldn't hold to that at that point. See, at some point, truth conflicts. And we have to resolve it in some way based upon proof and consistency and logic and evidence. All those things are really true. So we tend to ignore it or compromise it. But here's what we also do. We can reject it altogether. We can say, well, there is no such thing as truth. I've had people say that. I don't believe in absolute truth. There is no such thing as absolute truth. And my response to that is, are you absolutely sure? Because to say there is no absolute truth is to state an absolute truth. Do you see how God hardwired this world? Truth is inescapable. We cannot escape truth because that's the way God made this world. And ultimately, we have to decide about truth with a capital T. Matters of life, morality, eternity, those are big, big questions that are settled with the nature of truth. Jesus himself understood this tendency within people. That's why he said, as recorded in John chapter 8, he said, you shall know the truth, and the truth shall what? Set you free. We all know that, right? He was implying that self-invented truth, self-created truth imprisons people. It doesn't unlock them. They don't find freedom for verifying their own confirmations and their own biases. That's what's going on. Instead, truth comes our way from the outside of us to us, and it challenges our assumptions. And that's what was going on with the people of Nineveh. And I want to say to you that as hard as some of these truths are to embrace, if they're biblical, if they're from God, we must have the faith and courage to receive them because that's what happened with the people of Nineveh. They did. Though this was a new message, they received the message of Jonah, which leads to the second component of accessing the grace of God. Here's what also must take place. This is a key to us opening the door of finding the grace of God. We must have a response of belief and repentance. So truth comes our way. What will we do with it? Ignore it? Compromise it? Say there's no such thing as truth? Or will we, as the people of Nineveh did, will we respond in belief and repentance? Look at what happened here, okay? Verses 5 through 9. And the people of Nineveh believed God. There it is. They believed God. Jonah preached. They responded with belief. They called for a fast and put on sackcloth. Sackcloth was a symbol of sorrow, of mourning a symbol of repentance. They put on sackcloth from the greatest of them to the least of them. The word reached the king of Nineveh, and he arose from his throne, removed his robe, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat in ashes. And he issued a proclamation and published it throughout Nineveh. I'm going to read that for you for just a second. But notice how change happens in this city. Was it the government that passed a law? Was a law changed of some kind that kind of force-fed people to respond to God? No. It happened with a genuine spiritual awakening from the bottom up. Not from the top down, from the bottom up. People changed, and guess what happened? Government changed. That's the way revival happens. They experienced this amazing spiritual awakening, so much so that the king would issue a proclamation. He would say, hey, by the decree of the king and his nobles, let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything. Let them not feed or drink water. In other words, let them fast until man and beast be covered with sackcloth and let them call out mightily to God. Let everyone from his evil way, let everyone turn from his evil way and from the violence that is in his hands. Who knows? God may turn and relent and turn from his fierce anger so that we may not perish. So here we have a response of belief and a response of repentance. And again, that's how we access the grace of God. Two things were true for Nineveh. Two things are true for us today. We must respond to the truth of God by saying, I believe the truth of God. And we must respond by saying, I repent from my sin. Now, to repent means to change our minds. It means to walk a totally different direction. It's it's the idea of somebody walking in one direction and doing a 180-degree turn, walking the other 
direction. It's sincere. It's genuine. It's a change of attitude and a change of heart. How many of you ever watched the movie, The Shawshank Redemption? It's a really good movie, isn't it? Do you remember an episode in the movie where Red, who is played by Morgan Freeman, is sitting before the parole board, and he's going through a parole hearing, and over the course of the movie, which is over the course of several years, he sits about three times in front of this parole board, and they're asking him about whether he's been rehabilitated or not. I want to read for you this last exchange that he has, because before he was just kind of saying things that they wanted to hear. But in this last one, he finally speaks the truth. So the parole board man says, please sit down, Ellis Boyd Redding. Your files say that you've spent 40 years on a life sentence. You feel that you've been rehabilitated? Red says, rehabilitated? Well, now let me see. You know, I don't have any idea what that means. The parole board man says, uh, well, it means that you're ready to rejoin society. Red interrupts him and says, I know what you think it means, Sonny. To me, it's just a made-up word, a politician's word, so that young fellows like yourself can wear a suit and a tie and have a job. What do you really want to know? Am I sorry for what I did? The parole board man says, well, are you? Red says, there's not a day that goes by, listen to this, there's not a day that goes by that I don't feel regret. Not because I'm in here or because you think I should. I look back on the way I was then, a young, stupid kid who committed that terrible crime. And I want to talk to him. I want to try to talk some sense to him. I want to tell him the way things really are. But I can't. That kid's long gone. And this old man is all that's left. And I've got to live with that. See the difference? See the difference between being sorry for getting caught and being sorry? True repentance. To say, I was wrong. I've sinned. And I want to turn to God to find grace and compassion. So faith is not this simple, mere mental acknowledgement of Christ. It's not just believing that the house exists, believing that Christ exists. Many people believe that. Instead, it is dependence upon Him to do in us what He says He will do. That's what repentance is. Belief that changes our lives as well as our lifestyle. So at the end of all this, we find that there was a message of truth. We find that there was a response of belief and a response of repentance. And at the end, once again, at the end, again and again and again, we see the third component to access the grace of God, and that is there is a God of compassion. Once again, God shows up with compassion. Look in verse 10. Here's what happens. When God saw what they did, that is, the people of Nineveh, how they turned from their evil way, God relented of the disaster that he had said he would do to them, and he did not do it. So God showed mercy. God showed compassion. And the same mercy and compassion that God showed to Jonah for his sin in chapter 2, he had for Nineveh. And God spared the people of Nineveh from this punishment of sin. He did so for one reason, because he was a God of compassion and grace and mercy. So what we see here, folks, just to bring all this stuff together, what we see here is the gospel message of Christ is really typified in the story of Jonah. The story of Jonah illustrates what Jesus did for you and me. In fact, Jesus would refer to the story of Jonah in his teachings. You may remember in Matthew chapter 12, the Pharisees, the religious leaders, come to Jesus and they say, hey, show us a sign. And Jesus had done dozens of signs, very public, miraculous things before their eyes. Hey, show us a sign. And what was Jesus' response? He says, no. no. No sign will be given to you except the sign of Jonah. For as Jonah spent three days and three nights in the belly of the fish, so the Son of Man will be in the heart of the earth. Now, what was Jesus alluding to? First of all, we can conclude that Jesus thought that Jonah was literally a real guy. 
It's not just a story. It's not folklore. It's not legend. Jonah was a real guy who got swallowed by a real fish, a real literal historical experience. Three days. He was referring to and alluding to his own crucifixion, his death, his burial, where he would spend three days in the earth, in the grave, and then be raised to newness of life. Here's what we got to get, just bringing all this together. Please hang with me here. This is so important, guys. To understand the love of God, as I mentioned, we must also understand the holiness of God. And what we have represented in Jesus is this great moment where these two things come together. Jesus refers to the story of his teaching, uh, to the story of Jonah in his teaching, because again, it illustrates what took place in the repentance of the people of Nineveh. And the way that you and I can access the grace of God today, God is holy and by his righteousness, again, he must punish sin. What is due because of sin must be satisfied. But Jesus himself was the satisfaction of the wrath of God for the sin of the world. So going back, just think about that for a moment, okay? Sin must be satiated. It must be satisfied in some way. Now, we understand this to be true. The Bible records it. Jesus taught it. There is this place, a real place of real eternal existence called hell. It's a place of utter separation and eternal separation from God. But here's the good news. This judgment of God, this wrath of God upon evil and sin was placed all upon Jesus Christ, who as the innocent Son of God died on the cross to pay the penalty for our sin. And he did so once and for all. So God satisfied his own holiness, his own righteousness, which he must do, by the way. God can never lie to himself. God is this. He is holy pure, innocent, righteous, much more than any earthly judge could be, beyond our own thoughts and imaginations, so profound in his holiness. And because that is true, he must deal with sin. And the way that he dealt with sin is through his son, Jesus Christ. So what we see here is the fact that God's love is only made more evident by his holiness. We don't, again, understand the true love of God unless we understand the holiness. Because in understanding the holiness, we understand the wrath that was poured out on Jesus on the cross. And man, how he must love us to do that to his son. The Bible says that he who knew no sin became sin for us. All the wrath of God from sin's past, present, and future was placed upon Jesus Christ there in his crucifixion. And people would say, well, why would, a, why would a loving God send people to hell? I've got a better question than that. Why would people choose hell over a loving God? God has done everything <laughs> to provide an alternative for us. He has done everything, even to the point of sending his own son to die on the cross, so that we might experience not the wrath of God, but the forgiveness of our sin. So again, we can't separate his holiness from his love. The very act of judgment, listen, the very act of judgment upon Christ was the greatest expression of love for you and me. It was God's grace and mercy that sent his only son as a substitution for us. He paid the debt that we owed. The scripture teaches us that Jesus bore our sins on the cross. We often think of the cross only through the lens of us being cleansed from sin, which is true. But not only is the cross the satisfaction of our guilt and our fear and our shame that is relieved through Christ, it is the satisfaction of God's holiness and God's wrath himself. But again, it's one thing to believe that that exists. It's a whole other thing to avail ourselves to it. The key of receiving the message of truth, the key of belief that leads to repentance is the key that opens the door to God's grace and God's mercy. In the book of Revelation, 
chapter 3. This is John's vision, the Apostle John's vision of the end times. And a part of that vision in Revelation chapter 3 is the vision of the Savior standing and knocking at a door. In Revelation chapter 3, verse 20, the Savior says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and will fellowship with him and he with me. God is standing at the door of your heart. And I'm asking you. And more than that, I'm begging you. If you've never placed your trust in Christ as Savior, if you've never believed and repented, if you've never opened the door of your heart to Christ to let Him in, that this is your day to do this. Eternity is at stake for you. And today you can be free from the sin and guilt and shame, and the sin that weighs you down by placing your trust in Jesus, believing in what He did, believing in who He is, and saying, God, I want to turn from myself to You. So This is what I'd like to ask us to do. I want to ask you to bow your head, please. Close your eyes. And if you're here today, and that's you, the person I'm describing is you. You've never trusted Jesus as your Savior. You've gone to church. You've prayed a prayer. But if you were to die today, do you know for certain that you go to heaven? You know, the Bible says you can't know for sure. 1 John 5 says, These things have been written that you may know that you have eternal life. You don't have to just hope. You can know. Let's say tragically you were to die today. Just God forbid, but that were to happen. And you were to stand before God and He were to say to you, Why should I let you into my heaven? What would you say? Would you say, well, God, I've tried to be good. Friend, to even utter that statement represents such a misunderstanding of God's holiness, how transcendent He is, how pure He is, how righteous He is. The Bible says that all of us have sinned, that all of us have fallen short of the glory of God, and that there is no way that by our own goodness and our meek attempts to do good could we enter into the grace of God. It's not by our effort. The Bible says it's a gift of God. And the way to open that gift is by receiving the message of truth and by responding to that message of truth with belief and repentance. Are you ready today to do that? And if you are, I want to invite you just to pray a prayer just silently between you and God, just in your heart, a prayer that's not a formula. Please hear me, it's not a formula. It's a prayer that reflects the attitude of your heart. A prayer that reflects your desire to experience Christ as Savior. Your desire to enter into a personal relationship with Him. So if you want to pray that prayer, just repeat this after me. Father in heaven, thank you for loving me. Thank you for sending your Son to die on the cross for my sin. I'm a sinner. Will you forgive me? Please forgive me and come into my life. Make me new. 
And Father, help me to follow you all the rest of my life. Help me to grow in my relationship with you. Help me to experience your purpose and your plan for my life. I'm turning from trusting in myself and trusting you. And Father, one day when I die, take me to be with you in heaven for eternity. Now with your head still bowed, if you prayed that prayer today, the Bible says that you're a new creation. Jesus would say you've been born again. You've been born of the Spirit. And just like a newborn baby needs to be nurtured and fed and nourished, you need to grow and be nourished in your newfound relationship with Jesus. So I encourage you to find a church, a church where you can grow. If it's not this one, another one. Let someone know who would be happy to hear about your decision. Tell them. They can pray for you, encourage you. Let us know. Let me know. And we could pray for you, encourage you, and just help you to grow in your newfound faith. And for all the rest of us in this room, some of whom have been Christians for decades, can you in your heart right now just renew yourself to the great reality of God's holiness and how He channeled all that holiness and all the wrath that was due to you and to me toward Jesus. See, we hear the message so much, we become so familiar with it. We take it for granted. What a gift. What an amazing gift of God. So, Father, thank you. Thank you for your amazing love. I pray, Lord, that you would help, help us to walk in the reality of that love. We could grow in it. It would change us. That we would be people who follow you fully in our lives. Bless those who have prayed that prayer of belief and repentance today. Those who have come to faith in Christ for the very first time. Help them to grow, Lord. We love you. We praise you. And we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.